You have to remember Prince, when he was 17, turned down the first record deals he was offered because he insisted on creative control. I always thought I was bad. I wouldn't have got into business if I didn't think I was bad. He was setting himself for a very different career than the way Michael thought about his career. Prince did not want to start in the mailroom. He wanted to be treated as a rock artist, did not want to do Soul Train. Michael Jackson went from the Chitlin Circuit to the attention of Motown, teamed them to the biggest black artist, and then he paced his way to that mountaintop. Prince went to his managers, you're going to get me a feature film deal. If you don't do it, you're fired, and somebody else will do it. In the 80s, two musicians were consistently pitted against each other. It's like you were either a Michael Jackson fan or you were a Prince fan. The media would have had you believing that they were rivals in some kind of musical war. What they were was fantastic performers. Prince and Michael Jackson drove each other. A kind of friendly competition. <laughs> I can go there, you know. I'm a fighter. I'm very competitive. In 1982, Eddie Van Halen played a guitar solo on Michael's Thriller album. Quincy called Ed and invited him to record a guitar solo on Beat It. The song topped the Billboard charts. Later, Ed's solo was all over the radio and MTV. Michael said, I like using people who are the best in their field. On February 7th, 1984, CBS threw a huge party at the Museum of Natural History for 1,200 guests to celebrate the success of Thriller, which is still the biggest selling album in history. Prince was one of Warner Brothers' rising stars. His album, 1999, was selling very well for us. He was a big star. His goal was to eclipse Michael's success. And he told the executive team that in a number of meetings I attended. I gave him free reign to come in and use my office. One day in 1983, he showed up. He said he wanted to talk about something. He sat down. I asked him what was wrong. He said, I have to find a way to knock Michael out of the number one spot. Uh, it was driving him crazy that Thriller was breaking all the sales records. You really want to top Michael? He nodded, yes! Get Quincy Jones to produce your next album. His eyes got wide. He sprang out of his seat. What? For a second, I thought he might hit me. What? He'd become unglued. I produced my own records. He stormed out, still yelling. A year later, Purple Rain became a runaway success. Ah, uh, he produced it himself. There is no question that Michael Jackson was acutely aware of Prince's talent and his ascent. I am convinced that just the knowledge of Prince had a lot to do with why Michael sought out guitar superstars for his solo albums. Michael had a keen eye on the competition. The greatest selling album of all time was a target to strive for. Thriller had become the standard in music. The fires of their competitive spirits were formed in Midwestern America. I thought Motown was a great school. Competition breeds champions. Barry wanted us to be competitive. We were fiercely competitive against each other. Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, Alexander O'Neill, all these characters were alive and roaming the streets of Minneapolis. For a black musician in Minneapolis, you had very few options to play. We had to create options. It doesn't really matter how good you are if you can't find a place to play. It was another reality. If you can't find a place to play, you make your own place. That's where the whole Battle of the Bands came into play. Talent shows at Lincoln Junior High. The competition was fierce. And very competitive. Yeah, it was very competitive. Duality and contradiction would necessarily figure into their art. Prince Rogers, Nelson, and Michael Jackson were African Americans. And Ronald Reagan was civil rights America. There are a lot of black musicians who play other types of music but the doors aren't open. Music has no color, and it shouldn't have color. What I do, I don't want it labeled black or white. It's music. I was brought up in a black and white world. Night and day, rich and poor. I listened to all kinds of music when I was young. When I was younger, I always said that one day I was gonna play all kinds of music and not be judged for the color of my skin, but the quality of my work. If you were a black artist, you were assigned to the black music division, predetermining and only selling it for a second. Automatic limitations on what the record company would do in terms of promotion, marketing. He put out a first album. Nobody seemed to notice. It made it on the R&B charts. The R&B charts was its own ghetto. Most people in the record industry didn't even read the R&B charts. Prince wants to do the time, and he wanted the Rolling Stones tour. Well, I go to Quincy Jones, who I had worked with, with Brothers Johnson. 
Well, while I'm in the studio talking to Quincy, Prince is outside in the car. And I said, Quincy, I need for you to do this, that, and whatever. He said, Perry, I can't right now because I'm in the studio with Michael and we're doing off the wall. I felt the untapped vocal equipment that could take him even much further. So we took a shot. But there's other kinds of sounds of music that I love to do. It hurts what is inside of me and it can't get out. Right after I graduated from college, I was able to get my job at Write On Magazine and I became the editor about six months later. The company that um, owned Write On had a licensing deal okay. that Motown had set up. Somebody had to be able to get along with the Jacksons because they had to be in every single issue of the magazine. Prince used to call the job all the time. He would just ignore his calls. We didn't know who he was, never heard of him. Right. His music was different. I found out he was on Warner Brothers and they said, look, this guy, we can sell more posters of him than we can sell records. He would call like two and three times a day. People were tired of talking to him. He called and said, come to SIR Recording Studios. After that, I will have to be in the magazine. Went down there, he started playing all these different instruments. I was like amazed. He was really gorgeous looking at these green eyes, the big afro. Nobody seen anyone like him before. I agreed to put him in the magazines. After getting in the magazine, it became a lot easier. And even Michael Jackson would say, who is he? We were looking to make music for the masses, for everybody, and let everybody decide if they like them. Well, now it's time for the AT10 Spotlight Album of the Week. Michael Jackson's Off the Wall has produced four hit singles. And Rock with Juice and She's Out of My Life. Off the Wall and Don't Stop Till You Get Enough. Girl, when I do those solo albums and I'm doing all kinds of different music, it's wonderful. I feel like I'm accomplishing what I'm supposed to do. And it's, it was very successful. Do you have any plans for any more solo albums? The public kind of demands once they enjoy something. <clears throat> No one really understood what he was trying to do. One thing they don't believe, this is my real name. Another thing they don't believe, the clothes I wear, they think I'm doing it to gain attention. I don't think they understand yet. In 1979, he put out his second album, Prince. An astonishing thing happened. No one knew who he was, and that album went platinum. In the meantime, now we get our first gold and platinum record. We're left here. Prince did like me, yes, he did, but I didn't date him. <laughs> but but Prince would call up and be like, <laughs> he's like, he's like, yeah, like, Latoya. He has a deep voice. So, yeah, Latoya. <laughs> I give him a hard time. We've gone roller skating. We all went together, and Prince was there. We met. That that was my first time meeting, but we all met up together. I think it was like that. Kathy Hilton was there. My brother Michael was there. My sister was there. So it was like a group. Yeah, it was in the valley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I went with my brother, my sister, and Kathy. So, no, I, I didn't date him, now. I would always, like, hang up on people. I'm like, who is this? Yeah. Latoya. Okay, click. But he always used to call up. He was finishing up some stuff with the time, and they would fly out periodically, flying the tapes from Minneapolis to Sunset Sound. I have never experienced flying. The limo takes me to a hotel. Prince calls. He'll pick me up with Morris. Pulls up. Let's get you a date. Okay. My new boss and my new friend Morris head out to an apartment. Prince knocks on the door. This girl named Ola opens it. She's so beautiful. Morris looks her up and down. I hope she got some friends. And I'd see Prince when they came into town, and I'd drive them around in my car. Ola Ray was with him. I slammed the car door accidentally on her leg. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Is your leg okay? She was looking at me like, are you for real? Prince laughed. You tried to keep Thrilla off, right? Isn't that part no, of your history? No, 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 no that's part of the, the, the disinformation. Theory. No, no. So why can't there be a, a pop album or an album? Why can't everyone be like a hit song? Why can't... Every song be so great, where you can release it as a single. The next album, Thriller, its impact was beyond a wildest belief. In 1982, MTV was a walled garden. Uh, I think we always thought it'd be a success, but what it's turned out to be is, uh, is a phenomenon that exceeds the boundaries of cable television and music. Eddie Money Shaken from MTV. You also got to watch for Peter Gabriel video which I am going to get to real soon. Mark w Goodman, Mark Goodman. He's the same VJ that hosted the Purple Rain premiere in 84 and the Thriller premiere in late 83. So it was Billie Jean, and right. you said, not on my network. There were no videos by any black artist. You're not going to find much 
R&B. That's until 1983. I'm just floored by the fact that there's so few black artists featured on it. Why is that? We are looking for a certain sound and a certain point of view. But there's a, there seem to be a lot of black artists making very good videos that I'm surprised aren't used on MTV. What cable television does best is specialize. One thing per channel. You know exactly what you're getting when you turn on the channel. It was 24 hour heavy metal, crazy images. Yeah. Billy Jean, yeah, they said we don't, we, we won't play it. It yeah. came out right and said it. We are not all things to all people. Mark Goodman, he explained to David Bowie why MTV's playlist was so devoid of black artists. We want to play artists that seem to be doing music that fits into what we want to play for MTV in terms of narrow casting. That's evident. Bowie looks unconvinced. We have to try and do not only New York and Los Angeles, but also Midwest. Pick some town in the Midwest that will be scared to death by Prince. That's and black very music. interesting. Isn't that interesting? That's what's happening. We're, we're, we're being sat in the back of the bus television style. And if Pittman gets away with this and there are other cable shows that form, they're going to try it. I mean, I was like saying to myself, you know, I'd have to refuse to be I'd have to do something. Every time I was trying to outdo myself. And when they played it, oh my God, we were asking for everything we had. Right now, Michael Jackson, Michael's being a token on MTV. And so is Prince, who probably doesn't even care. Prince was starting to cross. We were going more rock and roll. <laughs> the audience is about 75% white. And that number kept going up. He really wanted to do the uh, Little Red Corvettes in the 1990s. He, he was changing. 1999, Little Red Corvette, that was the breakthrough. It wasn't the typical looking R&B band anymore. The lighter faces were definitely calculated marketing. Well, you know what they say about MTV, it would never made it if you hadn't been wrong. 1984 is the year that the 80s were the most 80s. If you were listening to the radio, you heard everything. Michael, Prince, Madonna, Duran Duran, Culture Club, Shaka Khan, Billy Idol, Cyndi Lauper, Wham, Lionel Richie, Van Halen 2. It was all there. <laughs> Thriller record came. It was time. Michael was on MTV. Prince was going to get on it. Little Red Corvette, 1999. The best way I can describe it, the vibe between Prince and Michael. There was this phenomenon where, you know, one of the marquee artists came out with a record and that the single or the album, whatever, it's going to hit a number one spot. But there's someone blocking you. There's mm. someone sitting at number one and you just can't dislodge them. It was a perfect time for Prince to say, uh-uh, he was going to get bigger than that. The extremely competitive, extremely driven guys that want to be number one, period. They can't both be number one. Where's Rick James? We were accused by Rick James of playing no black videos. Not playing his particular sound and his particular songs, and that is a problem for him. And we're being excluded from the art. I believe that all the black artists on MTV should pull their videos off MTV, because I'm not going to be a token for nobody. Yeah, they said we don't, we, we won't play it. You broke my heart. Mm -hmm. Walter Yednikov, who was president of Sony at the time, he said, okay, we're pulling Streisand, we're pulling, <laughs> we're pulling Chicago. Oh, wow. We actually went out and worked Michael Jackson and were eagerly awaiting the premiere of Billie Jean. And I think probably Walter Yetnikoff uh, told Michael Jackson that he did that in order to uh, improve his position here. with Michael Jackson. No, I'm enjoying it. Really came along and did what for MTV? Well, I think well, I what Michael watch. Jackson did was it was the first artist that was sort of an MTV invention. Yeah. And since the Michael had been around, but he had never crossed over. Everybody in America raised Michael Jackson. They're proud of Michael Jackson. From a little kid to Jackson 5, yeah. and now he's beat it. Or Billy Jean, he's now this super, super, superstar. And then you got Prince, who at that particular time is known for really pushing boundaries. Michael Jackson and Prince meeting on stage with their apex influence, James Brown. Should have been big news. No one really knew about this until YouTube. You could have actually rented the video at Blockbuster, but the Prince footage was missing. Some people say that Prince buried it. I've seen a video of him and James Brown gigs. Prince got on stage and knocked over that light pole and really, really messed up badly and embarrassed himself. Prince used to watch that video to him. Uh, wow. when, when all of this went on with Michael, they thought Prince was weird from before he even got on the stage, just the name alone, because there were so many negative things about him, so they weren't necessarily that they were mm. old and in like polyester suits so it was just the wrong crowd it was the wrong audience so everybody was more pro michael and, and of course james brown loved that kind of stuff because he wasn't ready to pass the baton to michael mm. prince 
nobody. So he was kind of like, let me let, let me let me see. First, James Brown brought up Michael, and he did his little moonwalk and, you know, sang for about 30 seconds, and everybody went berserk. So Michael went up there, and he sang, he sang for about 15 seconds, and then did his moonwalk or something, and picked up the tempo. And you see Michael whispering in James's ear. He whispered in James Brown's ear, and the bring bring prince come up. James finally says, the prince is here, or bring up the prince, or something, you know. I don't think he knew who he was yet. We had no idea that he was going to be called up. He was just sitting there like, oh, God. Just jumped on the back of the bodyguard, took the gloves, came off with the tool back at it, and came up there and chopped, chopped, and challenged Michael. But Michael had 25 years' experience, and the trips had five years. We always had this thing to go over by him. Even after he'd left Motown, he still would come and talk to Barry yeah. and get advice. Yeah. So he, he just didn't want anyone else to be, you know, he had to also see the good too. So it was definitely shady. The band is vamping, they're playing, gonna have a funky good time, something like that. And first he gets a guitar from one of the guitar players, and he fumbles with that, plays a little riff or something. But he doesn't really get off, and then he doesn't really know what to do, so he just does some dancing and a couple of, you know, typical Prince mannerisms. That's not the way you do family else, man. You join the family, you know, you don't want to fight each other or compete with each other. And you may fool of them, so. He was well aware that he had messed up. It was supposed to be like a like a city scene. So there were these cardboard prop street lamps. Hit one and knocked it into the orchestra pit. So it was it wasn't, you know, that kind of took away the effect of him jumping in chick's arms. <laughs> yeah. Michael, it was a little it might have been a little shady. It was just a real lot of kind of a little pissing match going on. And I always knew how strategic Michael was. You know, Prince Prince knew exactly what Michael was up to. It's, I said, don't you guys just want to be viewed as friends? Because I had seen them together. I said, you know, don't, don't you want people to know you're friends? <laughs> I'll never forget the look Prince gave me. And he just kind of turned around and he just said, don't be naive. Not asking me because he wants me to be his friend. This is competition. He was really pissed off because Michael set him up. So Prince gets up there and he doesn't know what the hell to do. And he hated the fact that he was up there. Michael Jackson has just freaking worked the stage. You don't follow Michael Jackson. I mean, it's Michael Jackson. And the thing that Prince can do that Michael can't do is play a guitar. But the song is just a riff. It's just a vamp. All he could do was play rhythm. I mean, it ain't Purple Rain. Prince was at a loss. He really didn't know what to do. I was scared, weren't you? James didn't know anything about Prince. He's not even really excited about it. He didn't know what he looked like. He didn't know anything about Prince. James has known Michael since he's five years old. He's like a stepson, like a godson. Michael used to come to his shows and sit in the wings and study him. Mind you, this is a period of time where Prince is starting to challenge Michael. They were already saying, is Prince the new Michael Jackson? The press was building up a rivalry. It was the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. You couldn't invent something better. It was just perfect. Look, Prince certainly respected Michael. There's no question. I respect a person's success, but I don't like a lot of popular music. You know, I felt like Jack Johnson then, too. I just wasn't going to be put down. Nothing can stop me. No one can stop me, no matter what. You know, greatness is greatness. People want to hear it, or they want to see it. People didn't get it at first because of Benson Price from Edgar Allan Poe. There was one time he came over to my apartment and brought Thriller, the video. And we sat down in front of the TV set. We watched Michael. Powerful. Prince was like, look at my man, my man. He kept saying that. I know he really admired him. It opened the door for Prince and all the other black artists. It was just an amazing time. It really was. It's me walking in. Michael, congratulations on the 26th annual Grammy Award. Thank you, music. had won more Grammys than any other album in the history of, of music. It created so much phenomenon and such adulation and notoriety on a universal level. Anywhere, do anything without press and helicopters and people sleeping in your.
your bushes and hiding in your trees. Some people are entertainers and some people are great entertainers. Some people are followers and some people make the path and are pioneers. I want eight. I work at Billboard at the time. And Billboard does this huge Michael Jackson special. He sold all these records. But the last page with a giant ad for Purple Rain. It says, the Purple Rain will begin. Thriller was also the setup for Purple Rain. You know, you had Michael making that mini movie. Right. Prince was very competitive. I mean, he really took it to everybody. Uh, oh, Thriller? Oh, I'm doing a movie. I knew Prince was a superstar. I worked with Billy Joel, Billy Idol, Paul Simon, Peter Gabriel, David Byrne, Aerosmith, Kiss, Queen. John Mellencamp was one of the most explosive entertainers you've ever seen in your life on stage. Michael Jackson was one of the most ferociously in-command performers you've ever seen in your life. But one of at least the top three of all the explosive stars was Prince. If the music is knit into your bones so bad that you need to make music almost every single working hour of the day, that in working hour, that you need to make it every leisure hour of the day, it's the thing that you live for. To you, it's more valuable than eating, breathing, and sleeping. The persistence is automatic. The work ethic is there. You have part of what it takes to be a star. The other part of what it takes is that ability to go explosive and ecstatic on stage and take the audience explosive and ecstatic with you. Those were all qualities that Prince had, possibly more than any other musical artist. It was a perfect storm. There's no way to teach someone how to do it because so many things have to line up. The movie was the surprise hit of the season. He won an Oscar. Have you seen Purple Rain yet? Have you? Yeah. The winner is Prince for Purple Rain. When Doves cried, it sounded like nothing that was on the radio. Well, Let's Go Crazy was number one on R&B station. There's nothing been that fast on the radio since. I could have never imagined this in my wildest dreams. And I would like to thank the Academy and most of all, God. Thank you very much. He won tons of Grammys. The record sold tens of millions of copies. It wasn't just the music, it wasn't just the movie, it was the fashion, it was the style. And he had black and white kids dancing together in his videos and in the film. It's limitless. We just scratched the surface with all that stuff. And I got a lot of surprises. I don't want to give them all away. The phenomenon was just crazy. And it was this black guy doing it. My concerts have always been dear to me, and it's almost a shame that I got so good at making records. I think of the live performers of his generation, Prince is probably the best. I think Prince could take out Michael Jackson on one night, or Springsteen, who I think are the three best I've ever seen live. The Purple Ring Tour, nothing like that had ever done before in black music. The only other thing that rivaled it, of course, was Michael Jackson, who was blowing up at the same time, setting up something that young America was looking for. And it was just a phenomenal pinnacle. It really was. And then after all of that, I announced that I was going to tour. The press had been trying to destroy the Victory Tour. My job was to figure out who was doing it and stop it. There was somebody out to, to make trouble with the tour. Michael is canceling his tour. You're the only one he'll listen to. You have to be out in L.A. 11 o'clock tonight. The tour was in terrible trouble. Such and such is happening. And one of the accusations made by a guy named Dave Marshall, and Dave kept saying, it's all going to be amateur. The Jacksons have not hired any of the people we know to build their stage. So the stage is going to collapse. The lighting towers are going to collapse on the audience and kill people. The sound system is going to electrocute the performers. There are going to be gangs running up and down the aisles with knives, so you don't dare take your kids to a Jackson concert. My staff get me a flight to L.A., and I walked into the building, and there were the brothers, Michael included, rehearsing. And I did not know why the Jackson tour was susceptible to this criticism. Michael explained it. I found the best people, and I signed them all to NDAs. They were sworn and signed to utter and complete secrecy. He owed his audience absolutely the best. And so I explained to Michael, the press had made the public doubt his tour, its safety, its professionalism. If Michael canceled his tour, he would validate every accusation made against the tour. Well, meantime, the normal ticket prices in those days were twelve fifty. And the Jackson ticket price was going to be $30. And nobody knew why. And somebody took Michael Goldberg, an investigative journalist, 
from Rolling Stone, fed him these insidious contracts, but also fed him a storyline, which is the Jacksons, they no longer make money, only Michael is making money, and they're vampirical. They want to suck the blood out of their brother with these $30 ticket prices, so they have enough money to live for the rest of their lives. Michael decided not to cancel his tour. And we did this tour that broke records all over America. The world was just going really, really wild at that time. This happened all over America. The first city was Kansas City. Michael knew he had a quality of awe, wonder, surprise, and creativity that was totally beyond brilliant people like John Mellencamp and Prince. Not even on the same scale. Michael's ab absolute commitment to give a total surprise. The setting record at Dodger Stadium, we did eight shows there sold out, and they wanted another two. So we did eight show, sold out shows there. Right now we're in the middle of this tour. And the demand for tickets was so great. We played as much as six or seven nights in the same city. And we're talking about arenas. There was this rivalry that was brewing. So we went to see the Jacksons on the, the victory tour in Dallas, Texas.